Hi friends, it's Reverend Laurie with Unity of Ocala for our Wednesday Love Notes this Wednesday, September 15th. Oh my goodness, the month is half over already. I can't believe it, but I'm excited to go into fall. And today I want to talk about a friend of mine. Um, not a close friend. He calls me his friend. It is the beloved Bishop Spong, John Shelby Spong who quite frankly has moved the needle to the right side of history for Christianity in his lifetime of standing up for marginalized people of the world who have for too long been beaten by the words of the Bible and mistreated and abused by the interpretations that fundamentalists have put on scripture. He is considered one of the foremost biblical scholars of all time. He in the Karen Armstrongs and the Matthew Foxes and the others who have literally gone through the scriptures based on the work of educators and archeologists for decades and unraveled all of the ridiculous liter literacy advocating of the Bible or those who try to push taking the Bible literally as if it is the very words of God when we know in modern times it was written by men. Even Jesus's own words were written well after his death, well after the death of the disciples. We know that now and we know how these words and these scriptures and these supposed words of God have been used by millennia to bash people into a controlled environment so that they can, the, the men of those patriarchies can continue to control the people, the money, the welfare, and the wealth of groups, churches, countries, nations. And so it is Spong I honor today. We lost him from this earthly plane last week. But his work, his decades of service, his amazing relationship with God will stay with us forever. He was the one that showed me, I don't have to leave Christianity to stop the garbage coming out of Christianity. I don't have to throw out the baby Jesus with the awful bathwater that has been trying to baptize us in this crazy, maddening, hate-filled exclusive world of fundamental Christianity. He broke us free of, free of that through scripture, through Jesus's own work. He wrote a volume, a library of books, just a few I want to shine the light on that have changed my world. Biblical literalism. This will show you that those scriptures cannot be taken literally in a Jewish world. Matthew Fox himself says, Spong is a truth teller who stands up to the ignorance spawned by a Gentile heresy that has hijacked the story of Jesus for too long. That one will rock your world if you're still fixated on those sins that some Christians tend to pick and choose out of the Bible that are taken clear out of context and generally misinterpreted altogether. Homosexuality was not, homosexuality was not scorned in the Bible, certainly not for moral reasons, <laughs> but for population growth. It's ridiculous. Liberating the Gospels. Oh, this one will open up your eyes to what those Hebrew teachers were talking about and what their messages were in their oral stories and traditions, not these twisted, ridiculous rules. Eternal life. Oh, this one I'm rereading. This is one that he was just working on when he came to visit us in Citrus County. And I got to tell you about that weekend. We invited, when I was at Unity of Citrus County, we had this dream. We were bringing in the biggest names we could to spread the word of unity, those unity friends far and wide. And we knew that Bishop Spong, well, we didn't know he was such a big fan of unity, but we knew unity was a big fan of Spong. <laughs> and 
we were teaching his work in all the churches that I ever attended in the unity circles. And it was expensive, but he agreed to come. And he came in for three days to give a, a, a lecture at the local college and to also do the Sunday service, which we also had at the had at the college because we just didn't have the space in our church that we knew that would be capacity. And it's so interesting what happened because we booked a hall in Citrus County. And oddly enough, three days before we were scheduled to rent the building, someone else had rented it. Yeah, we had picketers from fundamental churches in Citrus County not wanting Spong to come, but he came anyway. My husband and I picked him up. This was, oh my gosh, this must have been 2000 and eight or nine, maybe 2010, right around there. It was before my husband was, was as sick as we, as he came to be. And he was still scooting around and working and we went and picked him up. And my husband fell in love with his wife immediately, Christina. She is a beautiful woman. She's an English woman. She's got that fabulous, fabulous accent. And he just fell in love with her and was just following her around like, like this puppy dog in love. It was so cute. Bishop Spong thought it was the funniest thing. And I asked him, we, be, we became immediate friends. We just started talking about everything. I mean, this man is so brilliant. You can pick his brain about literally anything. But I knew that's all people ever did. So I just wanted him to have a good time. And I asked them, I said, they were staying at a hotel in um, Ocala. And I said, well, I've got you for three days. So what would you like to do? I mean, do you want me to host these big events with churches where you can talk to everybody? We've already got two of those scheduled. Or do you want to just kind of hang out with me and my husband? We thought about taking you on the home of Sassa River on a pontoon boat and just having a picnic. He said, oh, let's picnic, please. <laughs> let's picnic, please. So we did. We went all day long on Saturday. We went to have dinner with them Friday night. And I did take our board president and the president of the community college at the time who was hosting the event. And one of the professors there, the head of humanities um, and a couple other folks. And we went to dinner that evening. But Saturday, it was just the four of us. And we went on the river early and we stayed out on the river all day. Our pontoon boat had a nice cover and I packed a cooler full of sandwiches and cookies and potato salad and we just floated and saw the manatee and laughed and I've got I can't find it but I'll dig it up I've got the cutest picture of Bishop Spong in a fishing hat in um just a leisure jacket and his beautiful wife Christine and they're just chilling on the river and it was one of the greatest days of my life and so I got to sport him around and I asked him now this guy is a known scholar around the globe. He was a regular speaker, not just professor, speaker at the most elite universities around the globe. He was sought after for his biblical knowledge, his storytelling, his profound life experience where he himself had to pull himself up out of this a machoism of this man's world because he raised five daughters. One was a Navy jet pilot. One was the president of SunTrust Bank. And one was a prosecutor, in New, a state prosecutor in New Jersey. And the other two are educators. And he learned quickly that men do not rule the world, at least not very well. Women are the one. And he became this staunch advocate for women especially for Black people, especially being raised in the South and in the Southern church. But he also became just a dear, deep friend, passionate supporter of the LGBT community. As a matter of fact, he wrote a manifesto in which he said, I will no longer argue with those fundamentalist Christians who believe there is something wrong with these people. God made them as they are. They are not broken. I'm going to read that manifesto in closing. Today, I honor that man. And having all these acclamations, I mean, he, he was the bishop of the diocese, the Northeast Diocese, and he split the Episcopalian church when he married two men and, sir, and they served his church under him as what is just under a bishop, some bishop 
<laughs> high deacon, I don't know, but they were in powerful positions in the church. They were openly gay and in a very loving and committed relationship. And the Episcopalian church went kirk. And a lot of those that went kirk kind of went seeing the same thing in the Methodist community. I just talked to one of my dear friends, Chrissy, who has been a Methodist for as long as I've been in unity. And that's one thing that's always been a stickler of hers and me. And she told me, oh, the war is a raging. The war is a raging. Those folks that just want homosexuality pushed into the darkest corners on earth are rearing their ugly heads because church is saying, nah, nah, we, we accept everybody. Fundamentalism is on its way out. That's why it's getting so loud. That always happens. The bishop spawn. He turned me on to Christianity in a new way. He was um, the influence behind the progressive Christian movement. And now fabulous curriculum for children's Sunday school and amazing authors and all this fabulous research is, is the underpinning of Christianity becoming Christ-like. Imagine that after years and thousands of years of oppression, of twisting Jesus's words, twisting Christianity into a male controlled domination of fear and hate. And it's changing thanks to Spong. He actually said he and his wife spent every Christmas Eve at Unity Church in New Jersey because he loved when they sang, surely the presence of God is in this place. That's how he wanted his Christmas to be. And he said, if we really want to look at the future of Christianity and churches, we need to look at the Unity Church. He is my hero. Oh, eternal life. That's the one he was working on. It's about the afterlife. I'm going through this very slowly now. He wrote, he signed my copy to Laurie and Mick. Thanks for your friendship. <laughs> February 19th, 2011. Oh, that must have been when he came, 2011. I can see, and, and I could text him all the time and he would answer me. And so would Christine. Sometimes I'd just say, what face cream do you use? Because my husband still talks about your smooth skin. <laughs> she loves that he flirted with her the whole time they were here. He sat next to her at the dinner table. It was so cute. My husband was like 17 again. I kind of felt the same way about Vision Spong liberating the gospels oh my gosh this will give you a glimpse of what the jewish teachers were talking about what the disciples were actually saying and doing and thinking in the language biblical literism a gentile heresy that'll knock your socks off this is a great one for anybody, any one of your friends who are like, what's this unity thing about? What, what, I'm, I'm atheist, or I don't go for all that church nonsense. They're just a bunch of idiot fools. Or they're in clubs, like my husband, Jesus for the non-religious. I mean, he's written so many. These are just a few that I have on my nightstand all the, all the time. I probably have all of his books somewhere, if, if ever you want to borrow them. Reclaiming the Bible for a non-religious world. This is where he talks about what's in there that is worth listening to, worth studying, worth devotion to. The sins of scripture, that really debunks all those sins that we, think, that we think the Pope tells us we are sinners. Well, let's take another look at what was really intended. So we're going to be throwing in a little bit of spong here and there as I journey on my way, wherever I'm going, whatever we're doing. But I hope you take a good look at some of his work. Anyways, what I was saying, when he did come, and I was about to announce him for his service, and we were there with Daniel Namod. He joined us as well. And they, quick, they became quick friends, too. And I asked him, you know, he has all of these degrees. He has this... Uh, this reference, this bio that is, that is a volume long. I mean, I just can't even begin to, to list his accomplishments and just his life's work. It's too immense. And I asked him, I said, 
I've, I've gone online and I've heard hundreds of different ways, <clears throat> excuse me, about how you've been introduced. And I don't know how you want me to introduce you. Can you tell me how you would like me, Laurie Gist, Reverend Laurie, to introduce you to the greater Ocala area? And he said, my greatest accomplishment is being married to Christine. <laughs> so I got on the stage and I said, thank you for being here. I'm Reverend Laurie Gist from Unity of Citrus County. And we are so pleased to have a special guest with us today. I would like to welcome the amazingly brilliant and beautiful Bishop Spong, Christine's husband. And everybody clapped and so did he. And then he got up I just gave, of course, a profound and deep and meaningful lesson. And then he wanted questions, but he insisted that every other question beginning with and ending with a woman start. And he held true. And one of the questions that came up that always comes up, and I love his answer for it, what about abortion? What about abortion, Bishop Spong? What are your thoughts on abortion? You can imagine all the questions being asked. That one always comes up. And his answer is profound. And it's my truth as well. He said, let me tell you my thoughts about abortion. I have three thoughts on abortion. Abortion needs to be legal because it's going to happen. It needs to be legal. Abortion needs to be safe. It has to be safe. We must protect our women. And thirdly, equally as important, abortion needs to be rare. Education needs to be such a high priority that young men know how to keep women safe that young men know how not to impregnate, that young men know not to rape. We need to make it rare by educating young men and young women and stop pretending that they're not going to be having sex. It needs to be legal. It needs to be safe. It needs to be rare. We need to protect the mothers as well as anyone else. That's exactly I'm hearing a bee in here in my little cabin in the trees. I hope it's a nice one. I want to end with his manifesto because I just think it, it speaks volumes. And if you know of a gay person who has not yet come out, who is afraid to, or you know of parents who is ashamed by their gay child, or you know of anybody that's having trouble, I raised a gay daughter. And I have to tell you, my gay daughter and her gay friends and all of my gay friends, because I have loved gay men since I was a little girl. I adore them, I love them, I want them around me all the time. I just I just knew them when I was a teenager and I've never stopped loving them. But it wasn't around that many great gay women until my daughter became one or was born one. And I started seeing it from an even different point of view. And my daughter has taught me more about truth, about compassion, about being true to yourself and standing in your truth gently and lovingly and about life. Okay. Oh, Bishop Spong, I will miss you. Bishop Spong's powerful statement of acceptance and the Christian right. I have made a decision. I will no longer debate the issue of homosexuality in the church with anyone. I will no longer engage the biblical ignorance from so many right-wing Christians about how the Bible condemns homosexuality, as if that point of view still has any credibility. I will no longer discuss with them or listen to them tell me how homosexuality is an abomination of God about how homosexuality is a chosen lifestyle, or about how through prayer and spiritual counseling, homosexual persons can be cured. Those arguments are no longer worthy of my time and my energy. I will no longer listen to the thoughts of those who advocate reparative therapy 
as if homosexual persons are somehow broken and need to be repaired. I will no longer talk to those who believe that the unity of the church can or should be achieved by rejecting the presence of gay and lesbian people. I will no longer take the time to refute the unlearned and the undocumentable claims of certain world religious leaders who call homosexuality deviant. That statement is, I have concluded, nothing more than a self-serving lie designed to cover the fact that these people simply hate homosexual people and fear homosexuality itself, but somehow know that hatred is incompatible with the Christ they claim to practice. Thus, they adopt this face-saving and absolutely false statement. I will no longer temper my understanding of truth in order to pretend that I have even a tiny smidgen of respect for the appalling negativity that continues to emanate from religious circles where the church has for centuries conveniently perfumed its ongoing prejudices against Blacks, against Jews, against women, and against homosexual people with high sounding pious rhetoric. The day for that mentality has quite simply come to an end for me. I will personally neither tolerate it or listen to it any longer. I will not talk to those who believe that the unity of the church can or should be achieved by rejecting the presence of said people. The world has moved on, leaving these elements of the Christian church that cannot adjust to new law, knowledge or new consciousness lost in a sea of their own irrelevance. They no longer talk to anyone but themselves. I will no longer seek to slow down the witness to inclusiveness by pretending that there is some middle ground between prejudice and oppression. There is not. Justice po postponed is justice denied. That can be a resting place no longer for anyone. An old civil rights song proclaimed that the only choice awaiting those who cannot adjust to a new understanding is to roll over or will roll on over you. Time waits for no one. To my friend, Bishop Spong, I love you. I will continue to support you and spread your wisdom, your intellect, your knowledge, and your findings and your teachings my entire life. Thank you for being on this planet and teaching us all how to keep the baby and not throw it out with the bathwater. I love you. God loves you. I love you. I will see you Sunday as we continue to celebrate Yom Kippur, a brand new beginnings, and we cleanse and release our chakras, ready for a new chapter and new pages of our life. See you Sunday. Have a fabulous week. Bye-bye.